Welcome to episode 135 of the Startup Show. Today we are here in Zug and I am talking to the head of blockchain, Daniel Dimus, and we're talking about how it is to be a consultant, all about the technology of blockchain and the regulations, but also why it's so important to challenge yourself on an almost daily basis. Make sure to stay tuned. Welcome to episode 135 of the Startup Show. Today we are here in Zug, in the Crypto Valley, talking to Dr. Daniel Dimos, who is the head of blockchain and a partner at PwC. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm really excited. As you know, we have about 80% startups and then 20% who are people from the ecosystem. So I'm very excited to have you. First, I would like to thank the people who helped me out prepare for the show. So this is Andrea Girasol, Patrick Alleman, I guess a good friend, and Philip Ramsebner. So thank you very much for helping me out. Now, as usual on the startup show, uh, it's your turn to introduce yourself to my audience. So we all know, um, I mean, the two people out there who don't know you. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cedric. Thanks for the invitation. Great that you came all the way here to Zug, to uh, the Crypto Valley. So I'm Daniel Diemers. I'm now 45 years old. I started off in the 8-bit scene in the late 80s when the internet was, uh, yeah, was still kind of emerging. Uh, I'm super into technology. Mm -hmm. So in my academic uh, years, I studied how digital is transforming society, economy. I also did my PhD on that. So I was studying can trust really exist in completely virtual communities so people who never met face to face can something like trust to develop there. I was then going uh, as to the startups, so I had two uh, startups as an entrepreneur. Not very successful, unfortunately. That was uh, yeah, late 90s, early 2000s. And then after that, I went into consulting, and that's actually where I'm still today. Yep. Um, I went into strategy consulting, working primarily financial sector, basically in Europe and Middle East. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, students are watching this, so maybe you can explain to us what fascinates you about the job as a consultant. Being a consultant is, is fast paced. Yeah. There's a lot of change. Your learning curve always kind of resets after every project. Mm -hmm. And to be really true and honest, when, when, I was a, when I was an entrepreneur, I didn't have the skills that I have now as, as an accomplished consultant. And they would have probably helped me uh, get a few turns and, and for a couple of roads better mm -hmm. than I actually did. Uh, so I think the, the tool set, the skills that you learn as a consultant is pretty universal. You can do anything you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would have helped and it definitely helps every entrepreneur uh, you know, for, for him or her to, to get on a curve there. Yeah. Sure. What is it, let's say, if you look back on your career as a consultant and entrepreneur, are there any tips you would say, like, you know, look at these two or three things uh, before you start or during your start when you were like building your business? Building business for me is, is often you're very focused on the product. Uh, mm -hmm. was the same with me. I, I was thinking 90% about the product, how beautiful it is, how it will change the world and etc. But in hindsight, you know, I was completely underestimating the importance of governance, the importance of managing investors. You know, investors are not just giving you money and then that's that, but you need to constantly basically manage your, your that side as well. And fundamentally, it's about marketing. You know, you can have the most beautiful product in the world if no one knows about it. You're not going to go anywhere. So I think in hindsight, and that would be my advice, try to balance all these things much better and, and don't only focus 80-90% on the product. Okay. Okay, cool. So now you are here at a PwC Strategy End, um, leading the EMEA uh, blockchain department. Maybe you can give us a little bit of an explanation or an overview of what are your daily tasks and what, what are you responsible for here? Why do we actually have that role? It, it is fairly recent. I think it was created about a year ago. Um, I mean, there are several exponential technologies and blockchain is one of them. And I think uh, we all believe that blockchain will fundamentally change kind of the world, you know, governments, the economy, corporates, corporations, how we mm -hmm. treat data. So we created this role to basically mm -hmm. coordinate a bit better um, what's happening in the blockchain universe. And my day looks actually pretty 
pretty normal, pretty standard. I, I still do a lot of client work. That's actually what I'm focused on most. Yeah. Uh, and then in, in that role, it's more of a coordinative role. So I try to see what is happening in, in EMEA, but what's happened globally. We have a lot of calls, we align, and we basically look, you know, where are the trends going? How can we help our clients do more? But we're also very closely tied into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So we see ourselves as, a, as an ecosystem player, uh, interacting with startups, with students, with academia to really bring it all to life. Yeah. yeah. So let's get some of this inside knowledge. When you say, um, you know, blockchain, you're currently looking what's trending, uh, what's going on in the ecosystem, um, what do you see? I would say the, the two most exciting things, one, one is technology, right? Yes. I mean, maybe one, two years ago, there were only so many blockchain technologies available. I mean, this is now currently ballooning. There's so many interesting blockchain approaches out mm -hmm. there, and we try to be completely technology agnostic. So when we, when we advise clients, when we do projects, we always try to start with a white sheet of paper and then really say which technology fits best for that use case. And in some cases, it's not even blockchain, which is then very disappointing for some, some client of ours <laughs> because they say, we want a blockchain. We say, no, sorry, for this use case, it just doesn't make sense. Just use a normal relational database or we'll set you up something that has the same features. I think technology is, is one of the most exciting things happening. But then the second one is, you know, two, three years ago, blockchain was not really well embedded in the corporate world, you know, mm -hmm. to be true and honest. Not many large corporations, irrespective of what industry, have really looked into that. Also, governments were not looking into that a couple of years ago. I think 2018 definitely is, is a year which I see a lot of corporations are stepping into the blockchain field. They usually start with, you know, analyzing, doing some use cases, what can we do with it? But this year, a lot of them are getting really serious and putting a foot forward. Mm -hmm. At the same time, governments are doing that. And I think that's that's when it really gets now exciting because sure. something that was driven primarily by startups and individual entrepreneurs now enters kind of the corporate world. And, and those two, yeah, you could say worlds are, are clashing, but they're also coming together. And I hope something really good will come out of sure. that. Yeah. Well, let's say most prominent promising applications of the blockchain that you saw in the recent uh, weeks or months? I'm very honest. I think what we're currently having as a problem in the whole blockchain field is that most technologies and applications are northern hemisphere and kind of first world applications. I still believe that some of the most disruptive cases that you can see is probably southern hemispheres. I'm talking Africa, South America, parts of course of Asia. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a couple of very promising use cases, both governmental, from NGOs, from, from companies, from startups. But the focus is not really that high on it. I mean, if you listen to the global buzzer on, on the global blockchain community ecosystem. It's not typically the key focus. I hope also with my, my role and what we do, we, we try to push a bit that more into the front and center spotlight. Mm -hmm. I sometimes receive now people who all of a sudden make an ICO and uh, now we need blockchain, as you said before, like clients who think they need it and they don't need it. What are, let's say, the biggest misconceptions that these clients come with when they come with the idea of like, we need blockchain, or maybe they say we need the money from the ICO, I don't <laughs> know. But um, what are the misconceptions that you well, see? Well, I think you mentioned two things. One, one is a, a lot of, of small companies and, and startups come and just say, we want to do an ICO because we want to get 100 million, 200 million, 500 million. Uh, it would be good to have a startup and start with 500 million, of mm -hmm. course. The other case, what you describe is, is uh, established corporations, they come, they say we want to manage maybe our contracts in the company better. Could we, should we do that on the blockchain, you know, work on the on the use case for this. So these are in a way two, two separate things. We, we do advise ICOs, so we're very well, let's say, tied into also the global ICO community. Um, I'm always skeptical, um, and this is maybe me as, as, a, as a failed entrepreneur, but also as a strategy consultant talking, I'm always super skeptical when, when I talk to people and they tell me, look, we don't have a really clear strategy. With strategy, I don't mean we have a, a rough idea where we want to go to, but something that you actually write down and we don't have a business case and we don't have, you know, the company is not really fit, fit for business immediately. So they kind of say, give us the money first <laughs> and then we do the thinking later. Um, I'd be super, super skeptical about these kind of ICOs because factually, if you're, if you're an angel investor or, or a VC fund, would you give in the same situation such a startup money? Probably, Probably not. not. Yeah. Yeah. And you will look at the founders and you'll see what they have done before. Mm -hmm. But irrespective of that, I think the basics still count. 
Um, so this is on, on the ICO side, but, but I think a lot is moving there and, and I'm of course happy for every startup that raises money. I mean, back in the days when I did it, it was, it was a super hard task to actually, you know, just get half a million or a million. Sure. Um, I mean, when you look at it, say, on the other side now, we look a little bit on the downside or the misconceptions, where do you see um, blockchain can add most value, um, maybe even with a focus on, on financial services? Well, financial services, I must say, was was as an industry highly highly overregulated and and overprotected. So there's not been that many disruptive plays, right? If you look at digital, how it transforms the economy, mm -hmm. financial services is still one of the most, I would say, protected arenas compared to other industries. And there's a reason to that. And also, if you look at their IT, many uh, many banks and insurance companies run quite old mm -hmm. IT systems, um, legacy systems, and and I think that's. That's really a, an open green field ready for disruption. And we see a lot of use cases in, in uh, blockchain that really disrupt that. I mean, I was just talking uh, actually yesterday with someone in San Francisco, a very well-known, famous company that does a blockchain. Uh, I'm not mentioning the name, <laughs> no, I, but, but their, their business case is very simple. They do cross-border remittances on the blockchain. And I mean, I, I lived in Dubai for, for four years and there's a lot of money flowing from, from Dubai to India, Indian subcontinent, Bangladesh, uh, Philippines, from from workers there, right? And these are not the white collar workers, these mm -hmm. are blue collar workers. But if you see uh, how in the old remittance world, you know, the, the remittance companies would take 20% 20 20 of a transfer, it's a nice margin, but I mean, <laughs> if, if now a blockchain solution comes and says, you know, we can do it for a fraction of that and the money is safe and secure and will arrive where it should and maybe even faster than in the old system, Great, you know, I think sure. that's an excellent uh, use case for me. That is, uh, in the end, win win for the client and, and probably win for the entire financial services ecosystem. Of course, those companies who earned a lot of margins with that will have to reinvent themselves and maybe find new ways to, to mm -hmm. generate value. Yeah. Talking about the reinventing, uh, one of the key questions um, that I got several times uh, in the preparation was about PwC's um, main business right now is auditing, accounting. And, and this will be something that will be definitely disrupted by blockchain players. Is this something you're concerned about as, as PwC? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're concerned and of course we're, we're trying to be rather thinking about this uh, ourselves than, you know, wait for someone else to do that thinking for us. So obviously, you know, the whole accounting and, and auditing world, which I'm not an expert of, yeah. I have to, to admit fairly. Uh, in the old days, this was probably even paper-based, you know, so, so you had huge probably binders and paper. And, and one of the, if you think of a global company that has, let's say, operations all around the world, that that task must be really, really challenging, you know, to get all the books aligned and all the numbers. I think even today in the digital world, this has probably become much, much better, you know, with accounting software and all that stuff. But now with blockchain, I think there's there's a completely new chapter being opened. I mean, there is no reconciliation in a blockchain required because the blockchain does it for you, right? Yeah. There is there is a single point of truth that is not a single point, but actually a decentralized point of truth. So a lot of the key paradigms are changing. And I think the audit profession, and that's not just a problem of, of, of my firm, it's a problem that all uh, accounting and, and audit firms have, needs to change and adapt to that. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, some things we already do from, from our global network of blockchain practitioners, we actually started to audit blockchain companies, which is a different thing, right? You're not going to look at all the nodes and check whether the data on all nodes is the same, uh, but you're fundamentally auditing the protocol. You know, you, you'll do individual analysis on, on how the blockchain is developed, how stable it is, if, if all the, the consensus mechanism is working. So there is work to be done on auditing blockchain. Mm -hmm. I think in the future, people who choose between two blockchains and one will be completely audited and kind of approved by, by a global brand with a trusted brand, it will be looked at differently than something that just maybe two people been cooking up and, and said, you know, our, our, we have the best technology and just go for it. No. Yeah, interesting. Now I would really like to talk a little bit about the regulations. Um, first, let's say, to take this conversation um, to that direction maybe, are there, let's say, your top uh, priorities in regulation. I mean, you're part now of the uh, blockchain task force of Switzerland, like uh, really on the top level of the government. Maybe you can explain to us like, what is it that is the highest priority for you right now? No, I think that's exactly the highest priority. So I'm, I'm very honored to be part of the, the task force of our federal council. Uh, and it's good we have that because I think it's, it's going to become a, a key innovation advantage for countries who are 
to have laws, to have regulations around blockchain. And I think this is, this is why it's so exciting. And this is a global phenomenon. You see regulators all around the world mm -hmm. right now looking at blockchain. You see governments look at blockchain. There are laws being passed that will help, you know, fuel kind of the, the blockchain economy. And, and I think this is, this is the right moment to work on this. But it's very key, and, and we see maybe some examples in Asia, it's very key to not be too prescriptive and, and just, you know, forbid everything, yeah. you know, and, and I call this the binary regulation approach. Right. It's either zero or one, but it's very key to, as regulators, to navigate that and, and make a crystal clear, workable, pragmatic regulation. Because ultimately, I mean, especially if you mention financial services, regulators always had to stay abreast with the developments of the banks, right? So banks were doing innovative new products and then regulators had to catch up and, and all these frameworks, Basel II, III, IV, are kind of an outcome. But usually for regulators, don't underestimate that, it's hard because regulators don't have 20, 30 blockchain startup experts you know, in the, among their ranks. They exchange with the corporates kind of on, on a case-by-case -case basis. They may have some global colloquiums where they meet other regulators in a line. But I think it's, 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 really, it's really interesting. And then if you talk blockchain, it's not, it shouldn't be a national thing, right? Because blockchains ultimately are decentralized. Right. So what we actually would need is a supranational global framework that everyone can work with. Mm -hmm. um, I just hope that's going to be a good one because I think the G20 just recently looked into that. So I think there's a lot of work to be done and for, for policymakers and, and regulation experts, I think this is, this is the time now to really Get, get acting on, on not just blockchain, but then broader also, of course, crypto. How do we deal with cryptocurrencies? Uh, it's, it's an exciting time sure. from that sense. Absolutely. I mean, like when you look at, let's say, on a global scale, where do you see, um, let's say, Switzerland? I mean, you see probably EMEA, but maybe you also have a global perspective. Um, or how are we doing? I mean, like it's pretty hyped, Crypto Valley, Crypto Nation. Is it true? Is it a hype <laughs> internally? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, I think I think the, the crypto value is in a way a great success story because sometimes it shows how just individual names and brands can really carry around the world. And probably like the Silicon Valley as a, as a term is just something people never forget once you hear it the first time. It, it's a bit the same with the crypto value. But there's also, I would say, substance to it. So, I mean, yes, there's been a lot of marketing, mm. a lot of buzz, uh, but ultimately, I mean, you, you have a lot of very serious players here in, in Switzerland mm -hmm. working on this. And you have an influx of, of even more that want to come here. And, and why do they come here? The same reason why innovation in general is being made in Switzerland or in all industries, not just blockchain. I think we're just geopolitically you know, very lucky where we are. We have a very good way of regulating things, the government quota, etc. So it just remains and stays very attractive. And mm -hmm. I think the Crypto Valley activities ecosystem adds to that. That's also why we, we are part of this and, and supporting this very actively. Um, on a global scale, I would say I, I roughly see maybe three models. There's the model that you see in Asia. In Asia is, is from super enthusiastic and supportive to completely banning, right? So a zero one. And it's it's very mixed and, and some governments will have their, their their good reasons to do that. But it's it's definitely an arena that needs a lot more involvement of, of the regulatory scene, I would say. Here in Europe, it's it's much more balanced. I mean, you can see that, you know, countries like Switzerland, but also Liechtenstein, uh, Germany, other places uh, that are really trying to do a balanced approach. And then you have the US, which I think is, is as a market still very large and, and dominant. And you see it yep. in the ICO figures. Um, very recently, you know, the CFTC in Chicago was kind of the first to, to even actually step forward and say, you know, we, we're going to take care of, of Bitcoins. Um, and now the SEC has stepped forward. And I think that's, that's great news. You know, the more regulators are, are dealing with it and, and, and bringing out regulation that is actually pragmatic and working, I mean, the better for, for the global ecosystem. And that's also when the corporates, and this is maybe why these things are coming together, that's when the corporates are going to say, okay, let's, let's really get into this field because yeah. now we have the regulators kind of aligned with it. Um. Sure. When you look at, let's say, the trends, um, 
what is your personal expectation, let's say, for the next like uh, 18 to 24 months um, in terms, let's say, you know, the acceptance of cryptocurrencies um, and decentralization of, let's say, national banks? Um, wh where do you see that in the next 24 months? Well, it's, it's very hard, right, to, to do these predictions, especially, I mean, just as you saw in the last couple of days, you know, the Bitcoin made a little jump. I received so many Telegram messages <laughs> and what's up, uh, shall I buy? Is this the beginning of the, of, you know, um, it, it's very hard to predict, but I think fundamentally, you know, we will see the blockchain technology evolve and get now really into the corporate field. So we'll see a lot of, of actual applications in, in, in the real world. Um, I think on the ICO side, I don't think that phenomenon will, will go away. I think it's become already now an alternative for a classic alternative and, and VC funding. We see a lot of hybrid funding schemes. So hybrid would mean you would still do your odd two, three business angels. You would maybe still try to get some money from, from a fund or private equity company. But in, in, in addition, you do an ICO. This gives you kind of quite a, quite a nice effect because, I mean, let's face it, those who do successful ICOs, they actually mass uh, social media marketing very, very well, right? I mean, it's an achievement. They, they really manage to create out of their idea and their brand a global community of followers who kind of all, all decide, well, this sounds like a good thing. Why don't I chip in some money there? Which, which if you compare it to classic VC funding, classic VC funding is very intransparent. It's very often local, you know, so you have to stay close to them locally. And in that sense, ICO is, is very interesting. So we'll see more of that hybrid mm -hmm. fun, funding in, in the future. Mm -hmm. What are, let's say, um, I mean, yeah, this is not investment advice, but what is your favorite uh, cryptocurrency? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still old school, so I, I think I, I, I love Bitcoin. I, th I still think uh, the, if you look at the governance, the technology, uh, I still think this, it's, it's here to stay. But obviously, and for the right reasons, there, there's uh, a lot of other cryptocurrencies evolving. There's tokens, etc. So I'm not giving out any, any investment <laughs> advice, no, no, no. but, but uh, everyone has his own preferences. Sure, right now. sure, absolutely. What are some tips for balancing work and life? I think making the right priorities. I think in the beginning of the career, you're usually doing more work than life. But I think the, the, the longer you're in professional life, you need to switch it. With the exception of startups, most startups have a terrible work-life balance. I think as a startup person, as an entrepreneur, you need to fix it from day one. What traits do you look for when you hire someone? We actually look for curiosity. So curiosity of the mind, um, looking at things a bit different. And of course, just you know being fast paced and, and willing to travel also. For us, the international dimension is very important. Mm -hmm. How do you test, let's say, curiosity in an interview? Uh, it usually comes across. We do we do six interviews. Each interview is an hour. So we spend <laughs> net about seven, eight hours with a person, I think. And then we compare all the, the insights from that. We need basically six, seven thumbs up to hire a person. Yeah. So usually these traits, they, they step forward. Yeah. Right. What would you like to see um, in the local, let's say, Crypto Valley ecosystem in the next five years? Um, I would love if we see more influx from, from abroad, you know, more international entrepreneurs coming here. It's a great place to be here. And I truly believe we can only benefit as Switzerland from, you know, more people from outside coming in, bringing their best ideas. But I also would like the, the Swiss population, so people who are already here, across all levels, right, to really embrace this new technology blockchain in general. And I think we have a big to do on the educational agenda. Mm -hmm. So I think if we would step out here in Zug and now ask randomly 10 people on the street, what's you know, Crypto Valley? What's Crypto Valley? And, and can you explain what the blockchain is? You know, it would yeah. be an interesting experiment. You should do it probably. Um, so I need to, we, we, we need to work on this. Do you have a story of how you turned a failure into a learning experience? I think every failure is, is a learning, but it usually takes some time to <laughs> realize that. So yeah, I, I think uh, the, the fail fast, fail often, uh, rings rings very true to me. Of course, in, in, in my job, when you're a strategy consultant, it's not what you communicate to the, to the client. But of course, I had failed projects. I did projects where I did beautiful strategies that were crafted that ended up in a drawer. It's a bit of cliche, but it actually happens. And, and yeah. as a strategy consultant, that frustrates you very much. And then years later, you'll think back and say, if they had executed that or if that would have not been stuck in the drawer, you know, it would have helped maybe that company or, or, or the world in general. Mm -hmm. And the last one, who is your role model? That's a good question. And I'm I, saying it very clearly, Elon Musk is taken. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't name an entrepreneur. I would probably name uh, either a politician or, or a religious leader, someone who's, who's really put 
kind of the economical side of things a bit to the side and is trying to do really something good. But uh, honestly, in 30 seconds, I would we would need probably a, a dinner uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to get to that one name. name. One name? No, no. no, no it's hard, too hard. No. Okay, fair enough. And I know the last moments are dedicated to leave some of your wisdom and legacy for the future generations. Oh, <laughs> um, so if you could give us some uh, of your wisdom, share it with us, um, where you feel you're an expert, um, and give this advice to to all the people out there. Sure, very very happy to. I think fundamentally. Um, it's the curiosity, I think, that that's really important because uh, even as a startup or as a student, you, you come out into the working world and you're usually very easily influenced by you know, this opinion or that opinion. I think it's very important to, to stay true to yourself Stay curious. Don't don't think you know the the obvious thing is always the best thing. So try to work other ways. So I think challenge yourself intellectually. If if you're stuck in a job that's not enriching you, sometimes you're stuck in a startup, and you should maybe move on. And I think in Switzerland we're particularly not very good at that. We we don't like to fail, yeah. so we often prolong the startup, even though everyone knows it's a failure, we try to carry it on for, sure. for a long time. You have just one life, so really use it. And if you think something's not working, you know, just admit it and, and do something else. Uh, and the second thing is, and, and I'm, I'm now in the middle of that, I mean, if you think of all the amazing exponential technologies that we're surrounded with, and, and blockchain is just one of them. You have artificial intelligence, you have drones and robots, quantum computers that are going to come that are knocking at our door. Um, in, the, in the medicine and health field, there's a lot of things happening that I'm, I'm absolutely not qualified to comment. You know, how, the, how we can read DNAs, how we can probably CRISPR. fiddle with DNAs, CRISPR. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many things at Singularity University, I think they, they name about 100 different exponential technologies that are all interact with each other, right? So in blockchain, sooner or later, we see AI applications, and maybe they will trigger things that robots or drones do. Uh, and that again will change maybe the way we, we do global logistics, mm -hmm. or we distribute pharmaceuticals in, in the third world. So I think it's, it's going to stay super important to keep an open mind and, and look at, at things interconnectedly. So I think someone who's just spending um, years and years on one technology may miss, you know, the bigger picture, may miss the interdependencies between the different technologies. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that's, that's driving me uh, in these days uh, very much, because if we're really honest, I mean, back in, let's say, 1998, 1997, when we had the so-called internet bubble, technology-wise, it was not that super exciting compared to sure. today. Uh, yeah, we had a couple. Slower pace. It was I slower pace. We had the, well, I mean, when we looked at the early version of the, of the now World Wide Web, uh, we wouldn't imagine that this will be a moving kind of, you know, world with pictures and animations because just uh, the bandwidth was so low. So I think keep an open mind, see the interconnectedness and also stay curious to also look left and right of right. that field, what you think is maybe the best in the world, but stay open to, to look at other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned the, the stay challenged. Um, do you have any practical thing to do, like how to act, act, actually do that in, in real life? Challenge yourself. Yeah. Like, uh, what do you do to challenge yourself? Like, um, I, I challenge myself by by actually. A, taking the time to challenge because mm -hmm. sometimes you're so stuck in, in work and, and loaded and your work-life balance is bad that you actually never really question, yes. you know, how did I perform last week? How did I do today in that meeting? Um, that's one. But then most importantly, I think, you know, uh, yes, it's a social media world. Yes, you know, you probably have an Instagram profile with, with millions of followers. <laughs> but fundamentally, I think uh, from a so sociology point of view, from a psychology point of view, you will have a circle of people around you that's probably 10, 20, 30 people that really count for you in your life. And, and you, have, you have a bond with them. And I would say, listen to their advice and listen to their opinion, because they usually they like you, you know, no matter how many posts you do, and, and they, will, they will give you feedback. And I think I, I often try to really listen to that circle, even if they don't really know what I'm doing technically, they can still observe and give me feedback. So I think that's, that's one advice I would give in, in, in this new kind of digital sure. social media world to still stick a bit with these bonds that you have. Yeah. So Daniel, thank you so much for these insights, for your time, for your interview. Um, thank you very much, everybody who stayed all the way until the end of this video. Um, I really appreciate your time. Make sure to stay a few more seconds so you'll see who is up next week. Um, and I'll see you there. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Martin. I'm CEO and co-founder of Brixel. Make sure to tune in next Monday to see our show. And make sure to subscribe to the channel. <laughs>